Does God exist? Does God still interact with us today? Here's the good news. God is alive and showing up in people's lives today in the 21st century. These are the stories of how he reveals himself and is working in the lives of real people through the miracles, the mayhem, and the mundane of life. Hello and welcome. I am Hollis Moore. And I am Lori Spiker. We are two friends whose faith journeys have become intertwined as we felt called to share God with the world in a unique and different way. So here's our podcast. By sharing people's stories, we transform how we relate to each other and how we relate to God. Be prepared to experience the unconditional love of God in new and unexpected ways. And be prepared to proclaim, Oh My God is Awesome. Welcome to the Oh My God Pod. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Oh My God Pod with Lori and Hollis. I am one of the co-hosts, Lori Spiker, and whether you are watching us today on YouTube or whether you are listening to us on your favorite podcast app, we are so excited to bring to you another really awesome story. And I'm going to let Hollis introduce our guest today, but I'm going to tell you right now, if you are only listening and you're not watching, you're missing out because this guest has by far my favorite background so far. So I don't know, you might want to switch over and watch it on YouTube instead, but Hollis, hey, how are you? I'm awesome, Lori. Thanks for kicking us off today. And I would have to agree that the picture that Mr. Rob Lohman has of birth and pass behind him is gorgeous and very representative of what it looks like in Colorado here. So without further ado, Rob and I met kind of in an interesting way because I actually went to college with his wife at the University of Denver. And then through the miracle of Facebook, we were suggested as friends and I was following him because he had some great messages about Jesus and redemption and salvation. And then I kind of put two and two together when I noticed that they had the same last name. So we had a phone call. We figured out that, yes, I did go to college with his wife and we had so much more, obviously, to connect on. So Rob is also a podcaster, and I will let him introduce himself in here in just a minute. So Rob, I just wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to be our guest on the show. And if you would just introduce yourself to our listeners and our watchers. Yeah, most definitely. Thank you. It's always fun how Facebook can unite people a lot of times, as much flack as Facebook gets sometimes. But yeah, so I am here in good old Littleton, Colorado, which is just outside of Denver. And like you said, about 30 minutes from this beautiful picture behind me that just totally represents why I love living in Colorado. I'm married to my wife, Jen, who obviously you know. Two kids, um, son Zeke is 13, and my daughter Eden is 11, just turned 11, and Max the dog turns five or four very shortly in, in like a week or something like that. So we'll have to celebrate Max's birthday. And uh, yeah, so just, I, I mean, I love living out here in Colorado and, and as you said, podcasting and just being a part of being a part of God's big plan. Awesome. So do you do that professionally? And can you also share your age for us? Yes. I was thinking about that. I was like, yes, the age thing. So I'm 49. I'll hit the fifties and I'm so excited for my fifties coming up. And as you hear my story, you'll realize that this could be like the decade of just non-chaos possibly in my life. So I'm excited about, excited about that for sure. And so you share quite about a bit about your own story on your podcast, correct? I do. Yes. So why don't we start a little bit farther back then with kind of how you grew up in faith? Yeah, so grew up in Fort Wayne, Indiana, second largest city in Indiana, just in in case anyone did not know that. And grew up in a Christian home. All my cousins, aunts, uncles, grandparents, they all lived in Fort Wayne. And it was awesome just to have that family connection all the time. And, you know, we were really kind of like the, God was a big part of our life, but not kind of like, you know, really seeking, like diving into who we are in Christ. And it was just kind of like the surface, go to church, do that kind of thing. And then we moved to Texas when I was nine years old. And that was like a culture shock to Fort Worth, Texas. And it was, it was, it was hard for me because I, I loved my cousins. My aunt and uncles were like my second parents. And I was plopped into this place where people talked really weird. <laughs> and, and it was, it was, it was quite an adjustment period for me. And when I sit here and think about my son is 13. I was nine when we moved there. 
and I started drinking at the age of 14, it's kind of like, wow, here's this pivotal time of middle school, right? And, and for me, you know, we were really, really involved in like the church, church groups and those kind of things. And then at 14, things kind of started to change a little bit with my relationship with alcohol and life and manipulation along the way. And so do you think that was a result of just being curious or were you turning away from the church at that time? No, it was, just, it was curiosity and insecurity were two big, I'd say two big parts of it. More, more like the insecurity, because I was kind of like your goofy, funny kid that knocked on your door and like sold you magazines and books and candy and those kind of things. But yeah, something just kind of shifted around middle school for me. And, and I was just kind of seeking more acceptance to kind of fit in, in, in the groups, I guess you could say. And then that lifestyle kind of continued for you, correct? It did. It continued for all the way through my 20s until 29 years old. But yeah, it was just kind of, you know, if you insert crazy story, right? It was like, I went to Young Life, you know, and went to church and went on the church ski trips and was in, was involved and engaged, right? But, you know, alcohol was kind of always around, if you will. And a lot of kind of like leaders, like church leaders, kids and people I hung out with, you know, their parents were kind of a spotlight, if you will, but then their kids were drinking like I was. And, you know, a lot of my kids, a lot of my friends were kind of wealthy. So cocaine was a part of their life and just drugs and just kind of the manipulation and chaos and getting in trouble. But then you easily got out of trouble. And that was kind of like high school in a, in a nutshell. But I, I was like, I was a really smart kid. And so I used that smartness in a, I guess, positive and a negative way throughout. But again, I was engaged in school, engaged in high school, engaged in church activities, but I certainly was not doing the Lordship part of my life more just living the savior part. Rob question. And I'm sitting here and you're completely freaking me out because I have a 14 year old and I have a 12 year old, two boys. And I mean, I say this, like, I mean, you can see my eyes are like, oh my gosh, because you know, this is, I mean, this is like my family story and most you know, of my friends and stuff were in church where, you know, our kids are in church, they have church friends, they are involved in lots of things. And so like, that's a terrifying thought. I'm just thinking, so when you're that age and you have access to alcohol, drugs, et cetera, did your parents really not know? Were you acting differently? Were you saying all the right things to them? Like, I love God. I love Jesus. You're participating in church. So maybe they didn't catch on. Great, great uh, question, observation, because here's the interesting thing. So, you know, currently in my life, I'm an interventionist, recovery coach, and podcaster, and do all this advocacy work, right? And so many people's stories start with, oh, I started drinking at, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, like in these, pre like mid preteen, just kind of these teen years, right? It's like, well, what happened? Why is this such a common story with alcoholics and drug addicts and people that I know? Like, what happened in middle school, right? And... So for me, you know, alcohol was a socially acceptable thing, right? So summers at the lake, kind of wherever it was just kind of, it was, it, I, I never saw a lot of drunk people. It was just like, like you said, the curiosity of the allure of just kind of like, oh, well, what's the alcohol thing about? And so for me, and this is kind of like, okay, your kids might be going to all the Christian stuff, right? But you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. And the, the first time I remember getting, getting drunk, <laughs> was at a Young Life event in Fort Worth, Texas. Yeah. And a, one of the other kids showed up. And I, I, I always wish I could remember this guy's name, but I just can't. So whatever, kid, you know, mystery kid, showed up. And, he, and I just remember him saying, hey, Loman. So obviously I must have had beer before or something or just, I was a pretty like wild kind of kid too because I was trying to fit in, right? So I was hiding some of my insecurities by my wildness and, and humor. But I remember him saying, hey, Loman, I, I got a six pack of beer you want to go drink some with, you know, person B and C, which were two girls. I'm like, okay, six pack, two girls. Yeah. So we literally walked back to the backyard through these tall, you know, like those tall, thick bush trees. And we sat back there and I just, I just slammed three beers and they nursed theirs. And it was like, holy cow. It's kind of like alcohol had me at hello in that moment. <laughs> and, and, and that was really just kind of, and then that evening, because you act, yes, but like, how did my parents not catch on? Right. Right. That evening, I remember getting in the car and my mom looks at me and she goes, your eyes are totally bloodshot. I'm like, mom, my allergies and my contacts are killing me. And she was like, oh my gosh, you know, let's get you some eye drops and stuff. And it was like, got away with it, right? And 
but also my mom grew up in a, she had an alcoholic father and, you know, alcoholic family. Right. And my dad's family liked to drink often as well. And I wouldn't, I don't know if, you know, but so that was always around. And I think there was just, as time went on, it was just kind of not wanting to acknowledge it was maybe as bad as they thought it was because my brother and I were really good at like a lot of people that drink and do drugs or whatever. We're good at kind of hiding things and manipulating things and, you know, eating chili cheese Fritos on the way home from a party. So your breath just smelled like chili cheese Fritos and not alcohol. So co cover up became a, a, a quick thing for me in the beginning. Did you feel guilty? Like, were you having conversations with God at this time? Did you even have any relationship with him at all? Or you're just going through the motions? No, I had a relationship, but again, it, there wasn't, it wasn't a deep relationship. Like now when I'm all about like, who are you, we in Christ and what does it mean to have Christ as your Lord, right? It was, back then it was just kind of like Christ is our savior. We didn't dive into a whole lot of like, what does it really truly mean to live your life for Christ? Or if yeah. in those conversations were going on, but I just wasn't listening to the depth of those. Okay. And so, Rob, I think that's an excellent point. If you can expound on that, what is the difference between, you know, we hear that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. What's the difference between him being your Savior, but not your Lord? Man, oh, huge. I think it's huge, personally. Because it's real easy to go, okay, I want to turn my life over to Christ. I'm going to heaven. Nothing can separate us. Awesome. And then there's this grace thing that goes on, right? And God loves us no matter what. And he's going to love me if I do this anyway. And I think that's a lot of mentality for people, but in, in that lordship part is now for me, I look at it is it's seeking to know him more, wanting to be more like Jesus, striving to understand the word and applying those principles in my life and actually living a Christ-like life instead of just like, oh, I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. I screwed up. Oh, well, it's okay. He forgives me. And I think that's the lackadaisical laissez-faire mentality a lot of people take like, well, I go to church on Sunday. I'm good. I repented. And oh gosh, Monday morning, I'm right back at it. And well, I'll be at church on Sunday or I can, I can go to confession. They say confessions at four 30 on Wednesday. I can go there and confess to a human being, but just not have that direct relationship with God. Hmm. So was there a point in your life where that became more clear or do we need to hear a little bit more of your journey into young adulthood? Young, young adulthood and yeah, definitely more of the journey because that didn't come. It came in waves. Let's just say that because like in my relationship with Christ, I've been baptized a few times and there's a reason for that, which we can get into as we kind of progress through the story of, because it's, you know, you get baptized once and I mean, you're good, right? But it's different relationships and phases of my life with Christ, you know? So we're, we're just going to call the twenties a blob of alcoholism. Okay. Christ, God was there. I, I always believed he was keeping me alive for a bigger purpose but I wasn't seeking him at all. I mean, I went to college to become a doctor, but when you put alcohol and potential in the same room, alcohol wins almost every single time, right? So I got in trouble a lot in college, but I always got out of the trouble. So I didn't have a whole lot of consequences really from middle school and high school and college and then young adulthood. Okay. So I graduated college and moved to Dallas, came, become an adult and just have a job and do these things. But I was, I was, and I went to go back to get my MBA, but all along the way I would do things would happen. I'm like, okay, I know God, like I would never do the foxhole prayers. Like God, please get me out of this. I will never do it again because I knew I was going to do it again. I just wasn't done. If you know what I mean? Sometimes you just get completely done with your addictions. You're like, I just cannot do this anymore. But things were starting to shift in my late twenties. I had ended up in 1999, I ended up, you know, getting married to another good alcoholic, short marriage. God was not a part of that relationship in, in, in a big sense, because we were not seeking him at all. She didn't care about him. We were living a life of drinking. I drank and drove eight nights a week. So like God was just on a shelf, but I knew that if I died, I was going to heaven. Like I just believed that, but I was just reckless in my life. And I went to get my MBA thinking I'd be more marketable. And then I moved to Indiana. And the problem, when I moved to Indiana from Fort Worth, Texas, so, so I'm sorry. So yeah, I, I bounced around a little bit in my addiction to where I lived. So, but I was living in Fort Worth and uh, in Dallas, Texas. And then I was like, I got a job back in Indiana with my uncle. So we, my wife and I at the time moved to Indiana. And I remember going to Indiana. I'm just like, I don't, and this would sound so bad to say, but this is my relationship, like how I was not, so connected to God, like I didn't even want her to come with me. 
because I was just done with the chaos of our life. And we hadn't even been married that long, but we went to Indiana and the problem was we came with us. So the problem moved with us. It was in the suitcases. It was in everything. Right. And I remember getting to Indiana and a lot of interesting things happened, but I started really wanting more. Like God was pulling at my heart. I knew he was pulling my heart. It was kind of like, come home. And my wife and I, at the time, we ended up getting divorced, separated, divorced. And then in 2001, I was, I started going back to church because I just, I wanted more for my life, but I just didn't know how to get out of the rat race. I mean, I was 60 something thousand dollars in credit card debt. I was self-harming myself. I was having visions of me killing myself often, just driving down the highway and seeing my car veer off the road, hitting a median, and then my car would explode. And I would literally see myself dead. You know, and I had a real bad gambling addiction at this time as well. So, you know, alcohol, drugs, gambling, really hard to connect with God when you have all this stuff in between you and God. But you said that you sensed he was pulling you. In what ways was he communicating with you? Because we love to discuss with our guests like the specific and unique ways that he talks to each one of us. Yeah, well, one, I was, get, I was getting really scared. And so things that were happening in my life were actually scaring me because I would close the bars down and then drive two and a half hours to a casino in a snowstorm and I would not remember it. So I'd have these eight, nine hour blackouts and somehow I would make it home. <laughs> You know, and, and just the, the visions I was telling about, like just seeing myself die. I feel like that was just kind of like, it was like internally, it was like rampant. Like I'm, I'm scared actually right now. And so just going back to church, you know, I would hear the pastor say, you need to get your finances in order. You, and he wasn't saying that, but that was the depth I was hearing. It was just like, I was like, I know, I know, I know. Like, I just, I just know. You know and then one night it was, June 7th, 2001, and I was hanging out in a bar in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I went, and again, I mean, I literally went out every single night and drank and drove, so I knew God was looking out for me because there's no reason I should not have been incarcerated in my drinking days because I was incarcerated in my sobriety days. Interesting to say that. So, but this evening I was hanging out in the bar, and all of a sudden, I mean, there was music and girls everywhere. And all of a sudden the bar got completely dead silent. And I audibly heard the words, you're done. And then the bar got really loud again. And I look around and I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm the only one that happened to. And I looked at my friend, Sean O'Brien was like, man, I got to go home. I think I'm finally done drinking. And he laughed. He's like, yeah, whatever. Cause we drink all the time. And I was out all the time. I was like, no, I, I got to go home. And I remember putting down those, this big Foster's oil can, like beer can, those big beers. I remember just setting it down like tink. And I can see this happening as I tell this part of the story all the time, because I drove home and I was highly intoxicated, but I was like sober. You know, there was this, there was this separation that had just happened and I had no clue what was going on, but I drove home that night and walked up 12 stairs to my one bedroom apartment, my loft apartment in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And like every good bachelor, I had a workout gym in my living room <laughs> and the next thing I knew I'd walk past my dog and I'd put about 350 pounds on the barbell and laid down on my workout bench, picked up the barbell and just dropped it. And in the mo and, and this is like lightning speed of time happening now, because as I unhinge my elbows to drop that weight, which was a weight I could not lift on my own. Right. There's a lot of symbolism here. And in that moment, my dog started nudging my knee and just kind of doing that puppy head tilt like, dad, what are you doing? And I was like, oh my gosh, who's going to feed you tomorrow, Jake? And then I started thinking about my dog and my parents. And this is all happening like so fast, right? Meanwhile, I believe God's just in there holding, holding the barbell like, okay, are we done yet? And puts that barbell back on the rack. Now keep in mind, I mean, my elbows were literally like, like this, you know, it wasn't the intention of getting ready to drop it. And, and it was just something happened in that moment. And I, and I knew that my life was going to be completely different from that point forward. I felt at peace. I felt God's presence. I felt him hug me. It was like, it's going to be okay. And it was all this was going on like so fast. Right. And, and with his strength, we went into the kitchen and poured out two full bottles of scotch and I went to sleep. And it was such a peaceful night of sleep. When I woke up in the morning, I felt like a completely different guy, like 100% different. And 
I meant to call my parents or my aunt Carol because she'd been sober 25 years, but I accidentally called my mom and dad. And, and that was the answer to prayer. My mom had been praying for years, like just God protect my son. So parents, people never quit praying for your loved ones that are struggling with addiction, mental health, anything. Cause that was the day that I broke and my aunt took me to my first recovery meeting of willingness and I didn't go through detox. I didn't go through withdrawal. I've never had a craving anything since June 8th, 2001. Like it was like, I had never, ever, ever, ever touched alcohol or drugs or anything crazy. Whoa. <laughs> I have Hall- <laughs> I'm like, I know Hollis and I are, you guys can't see. Well, if you're watching, you can see us. I yeah, don't know what to ask next. Wow. So I just want to clarify because I had a pretty strong mental picture, but just yeah. for our listeners, you were at a point coming home from the bar that night that you weren't sure if you wanted to live and purposefully stacked more weight on the barbell than you would be physically able to handle. And isometrically were in that instant, you said all those thoughts and things are going through your head, but your arms are holding up weight that you typically would never be able to hold. And yes. in that time is when your dog was nudging you and prompted all of that second thoughts, what are you doing? And then again, the weight was kind of lifted off of you. And then you felt the embrace of Christ. Yeah. And it's so symbolic too, isn't it? And, and here's the other thing though. Like when I can't, when I was driving home though, I mean, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know if I was done drinking or what. I mean, I thought that was God saying you're done drinking. And so I don't even have recollection of putting like the weights on the barbell. It just happened and it was, and, and there, and it, so there wasn't this conscious thought of like, Hey, I'm going to go kill myself with the barbell. It mm. just was happening like on autopilot, which another part in my recovery, I had a similar instance that happened in my life of just kind of being on this kind of mental blackout autopilot thing that happens. And it's, it's scary as heck to know that. And, but there's, there's, there's signs along the way that can show like, Oh my gosh, Hey, Hey, this might be coming in your life, Rob. I'm like, oh, okay. I should probably pay attention to that now. Mm. Um, so will it, you will you move us into that part yeah. of your story? Yeah. So I'll just say early recovery was awesome. Like I was cloud nine. I mean, I loved it. It I used the same principles of the 12 step program program to break free from dipping dipping tobacco as well. But I was still gambling this whole time. I didn't know gambling was a problem in my life. Mm. I couldn't see that. I just couldn't see it. I didn't know. It was like, oh, we're just having fun, whatever it's entertainment. But so I was Mr. Recovery and all the programs I was a part of like, Hey, all right, let's go play softball. I mean, I had to learn how to read sober. I had to learn how to go on a date sober, how to play golf sober. Like I had to learn how to do life sober. And, and one, here's one of the things that like, when I look back now, one of my sadnesses of a lot of recovery programs is there's no Jesus, which is fine. Things that work for people, right. You know, God of your understanding, they can, go that journey. And, and that works for them at the time. And I could see that. Right. But I had this foundation of God and Christ and I wanted that. So I got real involved in youth groups and church and all those things, right. Doing things for the Lord. And I had a couple of career transitions, which because my brain was more clear, I could seek wisdom and guidance from others. I'm like, okay, well, let's go this route. So I, you know, became an eighth grade algebra teacher. I ended up becoming a college career counselor. I ended up writing a book and creating a documentary all you know, ran, ran a marathon in Rome in honor of my grandpa with team diabetes. So I got to do a lot of cool stuff, early recovery. And then I ended up in Colorado in 2000, 2004. I came to Colorado after a broken down RV, whole nother story. We won't get into that one, but I always wanted to live in Colorado. So I incorporated a business in Colorado. I feel like God was calling me to Colorado. It's just like, okay. And I got, and I got to Colorado. So what do you, what do you do when you move to a new place? You get plugged into church, like wanting to just be, have that community piece. So I had my recovery community, my church community, And I was like on fire for God. Right. And I thought my faith was so strong. And then it was 2006. God put this big vision on my heart to do a big free three-day Christian music festival in the mountains of Colorado. Okay. Which was the result of a dream I'd had a couple of years before. And in that thing, I'm like, I don't, I don't even sing. I got kicked out of choir in fourth grade. (laughs) I don't play an instrument. I don't know any musicians must be from God. Right. So I stepped into that, started sharing it. And then people, churches started coming on board and people started coming on board. And then through that, I meet my wife, Jen, who worked at K-Love Radio. We met at the Denver Coliseum. She was a, she was a marketing promotions person for K-Love, among other things she did. 
And she was just working a booth there. And I just felt led. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's the Caleb booth. I sent them a press release about the God Rally project. So I literally went over there innocently to talk to one of the two people. And like, she's cuter, so I'll go talk to her. And so I was like, why not? And so we just start talking about, you know, board games and running marathons. And my wife was an athlete and just kind of all these connection pieces. And I'm like, wow, I think I just met my wife. And I feel like God was like, tell me like, that's your wife. I'm like, really? Cool. And, uh, and then Jen was having a, a, a similar experience, but not because her friend was like, I think you just met your husband. And Jen was kind of like taking a break from dating at the time. She's like, no, I'm taking, like, she's like, maybe it was, I don't know. So we just instantly hit it off and I'm doing big things for God. She works for this big radio station. You like, like, God's like really in that. Right. And six months later we get married and you know, her dad was dying of cancer. And so we felt like we should get married earlier just so he could be at the wedding. And Archie died a month before we got married and it was really sad. And it was, it's kind of like a relief in a way, because if he couldn't have been at the wedding, you know, it was kind of like all the, we had a lot of dynamics going on in our life, like in the very beginning of our marriage. And so we get married had an awesome wedding. God blessed. I mean, we had, it was so cool. Like it snowed the day before and the day after, but not on the day of our wedding over in Edwards, Colorado. Yeah. But, but we were both really seeking God. You know I mean? It was one of those things of just kind of like, I live this life of like, do, 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 you know, kind of like everything's going to be fine. Romans eight twenty eight. you know, Jeremiah 29, 11, just like, okay, God, you know, everything works out for good. And then we, we got married, got pregnant, had a miscarriage. And then right after we got pregnant, we got pregnant again and had our beautiful son, amazing, handsome son. Zeke was born in September, 2007. So keep in mind, when I got sober, I was single and now I'm married. And for a guy that probably lacked some self-confidence, it started coming out. And then I had my son Zeke. So now I'm a father. Now I have this pressure of like providing for a wife and a child without a high income producing job. I was still doing the Christian music festival, which wasn't producing much income. All right. And then 2008, I get a big boy job, started selling software. My daughter's born in 2010. I now have a farmer's insurance agency. And I was not going to a lot of recovery meetings at this time. I was not going to church, engaging in church quite a bit because I had switched somewhere along the way of being a faith-driven man to a fear-driven man. I wasn't pursuing God. You know, I, I stepped out of Bible studies and plugging into mentors because now I had to provide. And for a guy with a gambling addiction, who's very active in his gambling addiction, but no one really knew this, I was hiding a lot of that. Jen and I argued, we fought a lot, you know, it was like, forget you, I'm going to the casino and I take off without telling her. It was just kind of like, there was a lot of deception and, on, and honesty that wasn't going on. Living this light, we were both kind of living in this false self or not false self. We well, yeah, that too was going on, I'm sure for both of us, but these false narratives about each person in our marriage, we had created like, well, you don't love me enough or you don't care about me. Or, you don't respect me. So there was that going on. Right. So I wasn't really seeking God a lot. I was kind of like, what the heck, you know, the, the God rally project, some things happened with that after the second year. And I was like, why did you even bring that to me? Like, look how much pain that caused my marriage. I'm, I'm seeking you. I'm pursuing you. I did that for you, but now look, we're broke. Like, <laughs> you know, my business is failing. And it was just, it was this mental thing of like, God, I, I like, I want you, but I'm like, I'm mad at you. And so my head was spinning quite a bit. But it did sound like you just gave it the example. You were still having conversations with God. So like yeah. kind of maybe crying out in anger, but then maybe not listening for a response from him. I was writing my Psalms, if you will. But I was like, God, I don't understand what's going on, but I'm going to trust you. But it just got so out of, out of hand because I, it, the, in 2011, I was getting ready to lose my insurance agency because I couldn't keep up with the sales and production numbers. So I was buying a lot of scratch tickets. I was gambling. I really wasn't seeking God for much advice at this time. <laughs> It was just kind of like, I'm taking control, mm, Okay, mm -hmm. you know? And so I lost my agency in 2011 and a friend of mine recently talked about, I used to, I used to talk about this differently, but I like the analogy of waffles. Okay. A man's brain is like a waffle, right? We can put our marriage in this little section and our job in this little section and our relationship with our kids. So we can compartmentalize our life, right. To just, not be paying attention to things we probably should. And, and I love that visualization because you can kind of see it. It's like, we're going to put all this cool like whipped cream and syrup on there, but bottom line, it's a wa compartmentalized waffle and nothing's connected. 
And that's kind of the way I, I, I did my life. And my wife was, so she was extremely worn out from, from working for the radio station and just having young kids and our life was pretty chaotic. Right. So her adrenals were shot. She wasn't very healthy. I wasn't very healthy. I was living on energy drinks and gambling and, and we're, again, our marriage wasn't the best. At least that was my perception. My wife was kind of excited to kind of like be away from the work career and just to invest in ourselves. Right. So she had a different perception of what was coming and I had a different perception of what was coming. We didn't talk a lot. So it was just kind of, I was in my own little Island. Like I had kind of isolated myself from friends and, but if you saw me, you couldn't tell. I was happy go lucky Robbie, but February, 2012 comes along. And again, I was, I, I had started self-harming myself in 2011. So again, like I'm God's child, right? I mean, right here above my computer now, I have all the, who am I in Christ, you know, scriptures and things I love and believe and see that, right? And, but if you were to tell me I was God's workmanship in 2011, I'd be like, really? Look at me. Like I'm deceiving people. I'm doing all this stuff and I'm not, I'm not seeking, like, I'm not your workmanship. I'm not your child. Like I, I did not want to acknowledge really what God said about me. So I started one night, I actually punched myself in the side of the head in my office because I couldn't, I was in paralysis. I couldn't function. I was just, and I just took my fist and went whack and hit myself. And I was like, oh, okay. That actually felt good. What I learned later is like, that was a big dopamine release in my brain. And my gambling addiction had depleted my dopamine a lot of ways. So I was dopamine deficient and that jolt to my brain like, oh, wow. So I started doing it more. Over time, as I would get frustrated, I would like clock at them. Okay, now I can get back to work. Crazy. Like some people cut their arms. Some yeah. people go get drunk. Some people have affairs. Some people do what? Mine was just like, just kick your own beep, you know? And But point where I would hit it so hard, I couldn't even put my glasses on because it was so tender. But no one ever saw me do it. So I was, I was hiding from a lot. So I wore these masks. But this evening on February 14th, Valentine's Day, mm -hmm. the day of love, and uh, we had a fun day at home. We, we watched a, a movie called Seven Days in Utopia. If you've ever seen it, it's a movie about a golfer who never measured up to his dad, no matter how well he performed. And in my mind, I had created this false narrative in my own brain that I am not measuring up to my wife. So mm -hmm. I had failed her and I failed her husband. Like, mm -hmm. you, were, you, you lost your job. Like, you are truly like a complete loser. Kind of back to 2001 when I tried to take my life. Yep. But that night, everybody went to bed. I was a late owl then. I still am now, not as much, but I just started looking for a side job. And then I started looking for a job on my computer. I was like, you know what? Forget this. I didn't say nice things to myself back then. You know, I used a few profanity words to myself, but I was like, you know, whatever, forget this. So I get up and start organizing our townhouse because it was a complete mess due to something else that happened in 2011 and we were remodeling our kitchen. And I had no clue about this, but I hate my life was chaotic. Our house was chaotic. No, I was completely out of control, right? Because, and I hate clutter, but I didn't know that back then. Mm -hmm. All the things I wish I would have known. Clutter does not bother me as much anymore, but it did then. And so I just had this moment where I got up on the couch and was organizing. And the next thing I know, I had grabbed a box of matches and lit some boxes on fire on my covered patio. And I could not stop it. So we lived in a townhouse community and I had to shut the door, run upstairs, rip my wife out of bed. She had to get my kids out, I, my two-year-old daughter out of her crib. I had to grab my four-year-old son out of his bed and run downstairs. Meanwhile, the fire is still outside. And I I believe like God's hand was just holding the fire back. <laughs> it was like, okay, get out of the house, like go. But I was outside getting my neighbors up because it was a townhouse. And as soon as we, my the four of us and our dog walked out the front door, the backdraft caught and completely blew the covered patio on our back porch because it get melted the gas meter. And I turned around and like our, the front window just got completely black and we pretty much lost everything that night. Wow. Whoa. Thank God nobody got hurt. Nobody got hurt physically. A lot of obviously emotional and mental damage that resulted of that. But this is 11 years without drugs or alcohol. I had no clue about how gambling, the process addiction of gambling just completely screws people up, which I learned later in my professional career. So I speak about it a lot, but in the moment when you're, when I was just that far disconnected from everything going on, like my actions just, it's incredible to think I got to that point. 
And that was not something I could cover. Hey everyone, this is Lori. Isn't Rob's story amazing? We'll get right back to it in just a minute. But before we do, we wanted to give you some information about how Rob is using his story to serve others. Sober since 2001, Rob currently helps people suffering from substance abuse to find freedom from addiction and incarceration. He does this by sharing his personal testimony. He provides professional interventions and recovery coaching, and he's the host of two successful podcasts called Beyond the Bars Radio Podcast and Addiction, Freedom, and Faith Podcast. Rob now invests in the lives of those wanting to see positive change, whether it's coming out of addiction, prison, or just wanting more for their lives. He is a dynamic speaker and shares an extremely powerful journey of persistence, faith, and inspiration. You can get more information about Rob and all the services he provides at liftedfromtherut.com. We'll also have his contact information and links in the show notes of this episode. Okay, now back to the story. Did you just, cause I'm a little unclear. Did you purposely set the boxes on fire? I was driven by, I, I say I was driven by my subconscious in my life back then. Cause I never thought like, Hey, let's set the house on fire. Okay. That'd be a good idea. It was literally just like, it's, it's so amazing when you, when you start looking at this, like I have been able to since then of just yeah. like all these beliefs that we like these horrible beliefs we have about ourselves and our subconscious and just what we put into our brain like drives us like I had no clue how I was I was driven by self hatred of myself like I and mean, there was so much self hatred and self loathing and failure and all these things that I, I can tell you I still don't have a clear answer about that evening like you did okay. this for this reason like some people just wanted it to be like you did it for insurance reasons I'm like no I wasn't thinking that I just literally like flip and lost it and instead yeah. of a barbell time it was a box of matches you know and I I I've just had just got I just had peace with that night that it it just happened I can't give you an a b c d okay. because I was not mentally stable in any shape or form in my life then and so no it wasn't a hey this would be a great idea let's do this and make this happen and it was just it just happened and that's the scary thing about it yeah right it just yeah. happened right and but I know you know just how the subconscious can really mess us up and when I can, now I combat this all with who I am in Christ. Cause I still deal with suicide ideation every now and then it comes and goes in my life. God has not removed that completely from me. Mm -hmm. So even since 2012, you know, I just, just, just speed this up a little bit. I did end up, my wife, she had to go through her own process of like, who's this crazy dude I married. Mm -hmm. So I immediately like ran back to AA, ran back to church, went back to Bible studies, sought God, like all my knees praying, God, please show me what happened. You know, psychiatrist, psychologist, all these things, right? I was under investigation, you know, and I ended up confessing to the crime in June of 2012 to authorities just because I had to, like, I couldn't, even my attorney said, well, if we, if we go to trial and you get away with this, what are you going to do? I was like, dude, I can't, I cannot lie about, like, I can't lie about this for my life. Like, no, I, I, ref I refuse to do that. So we started bringing in our Christian community and saying, hey, you know, like if you two were like our good friends back then, we'd be like, you know, Lori and Hollis, let me just tell you like what happened. Cause like, I just need to tell you because what I've told you before is a lie on how it happened. And our community started kind of lo loving us and some just kind of didn't want anything to do with us. And it was, you know, kind of like, are you crazy? Are you not? Who is this guy? So my wife and I just, she had to do her own journey. I had to do my journey. But the minute I confessed while well, I, I was down in Texas, when I called the investigator and I was like, okay, here we go. Like, I'm going to tell them what happened. And I'm just going to deal with this when I get home. And I just said, okay, God, this is your show. I cannot change this, but I'm willing to accept whatever comes. And I was all in for Jesus. Just like, okay, this is your deal. I don't know what's going to happen. And so I confessed in June. And then in December of that year, I got arrested on 19 felonies and 13 misdemeanors. And they came at me. But the funny thing was I was always, they always knew where I was because I would call and communicate with them. <laughs> my attorney would communicate, but they would not let me turn myself in. There's so many weird things with this what? deal. I don't know. They, they would not okay. let us like walk through the door and say, Hey, we want to come in and have a conversation and tell you what happened. It was, we, we don't know what happened. I mean, I have my own theories, but they're just theories. But once 
the investigators found out that a lot of people knew I had confessed to friends and family and people knew I had set the fire, that would have looked really bad for West Metro to like, you know, for the, for my neighbors to know like what he told you six months ago and you never told anybody. So I don't know what happened. I fell through the cracks or they just wanted to prove it on their own or whatever. But, okay. but I got arrested that day. God, I mean, God really protected our family through a lot of this too, from my kids not having no clue what happened and not seeing me get arrested and protecting. There's some things that happened that day that were really weird, but he just protected their eyes from not seeing any of this. Sure. And so they arrested me that day. And uh, I remember the investigator in the car, when the whole thing happened in February, he said to me, Rob, if you just confess to me that you did this, because we know you're a man of God, I promise you, you'll never see the inside of a jail cell. I'm like, nope, nope, nope. You're not, you're lying to me. I'm not going to believe you or anybody. So, but this day when I was sitting in his car, when he arrested me, he's like, well, I guess you'll get another book out of this deal. That was his comment to me. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to write you as one of the main characters. Um, just kidding. But I had to work through a lot of that. You know, I got arrested. You know, God reduced my bond from 100 grand to 25 grand, which totally shocked my attorney. I was able to get home in a couple of days, okay. live with my family on a highly modified protection order. And eight months later, I got to end up getting sentenced to what should have been two years of work release to 56 years in prison. So you talk about trusting God in this process, wait, right? Wait, say that again. So I was looking at anywhere from two years of work release to 56 years in prison. Okay. Was range. Of that sentence. was the, okay. Okay. Yeah. So that was the range. Cause it, we had this opportunity to either plea down to something or have an open sentencing. Okay. And so, so the day we went to court, we had like 35 people in the courtroom with us. I mean, pastors from a lot of churches were with us. Like our community was there. It was tons and tons of support and we had no clue what would happen that day. But you talk about trusting God, like it's kind of like, okay, God, my wife and I, were just going to trust you with this part of the story. Cause we have no clue what's going to happen, but you do. Yeah. And whatever you, whatever we see happening, I just believe there's a, so much more happening behind the scenes. Yeah. So we're sitting there that day and not having no, it, it was a crazy circus in there. I mean, it's almost like, I wish I had a tape recording, a video recording of that day. So I'm like, what is, what is going on in here? There was so much crazy spiritual warfare and just like people were flipping out on the other side. It was, I'm like, okay, didn't get it at all. But when the judge got to the end, he said, okay, uh, Mr. Loman, you're getting, you have two counts of arson. And for the first count, you're going to serve eight years in prison in the Department of Corrections. And for the second count, you're going to serve five years. So 30, 13 years is what my sentence was supposed to be. And he said, and by the way, I feel like this should have been classified as attempted murder. Hit his gavel and they sent me through the door. That was the last thing my community heard. <laughs> and it was like, wow, pin, a pin could have dropped in there from both sides of the courtroom. And they just put the cuffs on and walked me through the door. And I thought I was gone for 13 years. My wife thought I was gone for 13 years. I was like, well, there goes my husband. What the heck am I going to do now? So then we had to learn how to navigate the prison system, which is why I'm an advocate for the prison system. Now people going into the prison system and coming out because we didn't know. So speeding the story up a little bit, <laughs> I was fortunately only in prison for 10 and a half months. And while which, I was, um, so that you're, which prison did you go to? I went to, I had spent nine and a half months in Delta, which is on the other side of Colorado, okay. on the far Western side of Colorado, for those that aren't from Colorado, the furthest prison away they could send me for my family, which okay. the system likes to do that in some weird way. It's like, let's send them as far away as they can go. So their family just has to go through all this stupid rigmarole to get to go see them right but okay I mean, we had to learn how to you know like how to how do you call somebody how do you order shampoo and <laughs> toothpaste and learn the system which when you're in the system and i'm trusting god i'm like well do i tell people what i did if people are checking me up <laughs> it, it, it was such a weird thing but i literally you know 23 hour lockdowns in your cells for the first almost two months and or month actually and so i just read my bible all the time i read my recovery book I went to the church meetings they had. I took advantage of the chaplain. Thank God for chaplains that would come by and like, yeah, I want to talk to you, you know? And I started journaling and I was like, so God just spoke to me a lot in my cell and I can go back and like read my journals. Now I'm like, I don't remember writing that. But meanwhile, my wife is home being a single mom. So she's having to endure 
How do I put food on the table? Am I supposed to work or not work? Do I just take care of the kids? Where are they going to go to school? So the, the Christian community really surrounded my wife, which was totally awesome to see. So I, I knew they were taken care of. I just had to figure me out while I was in there. Were you terrified? I just like just prison and all the things you hear. And I'm sure it's a whole topic for another podcast, maybe. But like, were you terrified? No, because okay. I knew that God was going to take care of me. Okay. I had so much peace, strange peace, because I just knew. Here's I, I, I believed I was there for a reason. Obviously, I, something to learn. I didn't look at like, why did this happen to me? I was like, okay, what am I supposed to learn here? <laughs> okay, okay, this was the biggest mistake in my life, and I'm going to make it the biggest opportunity of my life. And so I that just- was your thought things. process at yeah. the time? Yeah, totally, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, that was what was being revealed to me in my journaling. And if, if you're watching on video and stuff, and I know it's, if you're not, you can't see us, but I always have this stack of books over my right shoulder because these are like my prison books, the books I read that got me closer to God. I read 42 books when I was gone in 10 and a half months and like studied the heck out of them. I mean, Mark Batterson, John Ortberg, Dallas Willard. I actually read the Bible from front to back for the first time in my entire life as a Christian at 40 something years old. The 90 day challenge, read your Bible in 90 days. I'm like, well, let me check my calendar. Yeah, pretty much I'm free. So I, I literally, my wife says, it's like you went to seminary, which I believe that's kind of what it was like because I took you know, 11 different life learning classes. When I pulled up to the prison where I, my final stay was, it was a minimum security prison. They call it a camp. So I can literally tell my daughter I went to camp and I'm not lying. She doesn't know the whole story yet. My son does. But, but I pulled up and there were deer on the property in a, in a huge standalone chapel. And we pulled up there and I literally felt like God said, I got this, you know, like you're going to be fine. And I, and I, so I, I never really felt threatened. There were threatening moments for sure. That I saw happen. I mean, I don't, I usually don't get sad about that, but I sit there and th like watch what some guys had to go through that are like institutionalized, like fighting is their thing, you yeah. know? And it was just like, that's their thing. It's just like kick someone's butt, get respect, you know? And it was just, it's so, it was just so sad to see people in that mentality, you know? But, but while I was incarcerated, I mean, I was around, I mean, Jehovah witnesses and devout Catholics and, Eastern Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox Jews, and it was like Wiccans and Asachis, like all these different religions that really we don't get to experience most of the time in our life because we can go to different Starbucks or I don't like those people. I'm going to go down here and like we avoid people, but I could not avoid people. So it forced me to really dive into my faith because I would get annoyed at people. I'm like, whatever, that's so stupid. You guys believe that? And it's like, but I didn't know what I believed because I never really had ever, and I've been, you know, Christian from birth, right? It's like, but I never, ever, ever studied like what, so God was just revealing so much to me, like, man, oh my gosh. I'm like, really? This is so cool. I'm like, oh, I never knew this. Gosh, wish I would have known it back then. But so I just studied and I got released in 10 and a half months on a charge to a halfway house that they don't let arsonists into halfway houses because of insurance reasons. So why were you released early? So for people that don't understand like the system I mean, there's like a whole podcast we could do on that but basically like yeah. they take your sentence they cut it in half for good time 19 months before that you're allowed to apply for a halfway house okay so i was like right in that time frame right and my my case manager was like rob and he was a christian he's like don't get your hopes up i mean half, most of the guards there are like dude what are you even doing here <laughs> you know i'm not like your typical prison guy if people yeah. look at a typical prison guy you know but there's a lot of non-typical prison guys that I hung out with when I was there. But he would tell me, like, don't get your hopes up. But here's the deal. Mark Batterson, if you listen to this podcast, hey, y'all should get Mark Batterson to listen to this podcast. So Hollis and Lori would love that, I'm sure. Yeah. But Mark Batterson wrote a, one of the books called Circle Maker. And in the Circle Maker, it talks about quit praying for what God's already promised you. Okay. And I, and I took, I took, I, I listened to that. It made me pause. And I was like, okay, so my prayers and stuff, God promised me, I healed your marriage and you'll get into the halfway house the first round. So I held on to that. I would do like, working out, I would do like seven reps, seven sets with seven reps. Everything was seven. I'm like, walls of Jericho, we're like seven, seven, everything, right? And so when the time came around to apply, I, I got rejected by the first halfway house. You have like four 
like A, B, C, or D in the first round. Okay. And my mom and my wife were like so bummed. You didn't get into ICCS. You know, I don't even remember what that stands for, but who cares? I one and a half way out. right. I'm like, it's okay. Like mom, mom, Jen, like I'm telling you, God promised me I would get into the halfway house this round. So just let's just trust that. And the second one, sure enough, it was great. It was 7.2 miles from my family's house over here in Littleton, Colorado, you know, and it was a perfect placement. And the first day I was there, my mom was in town and then my, my wife came and the kids and they let me go to church that first weekend to Red Rocks Church here in Littleton. That usually takes two or three months to go. But because my mom was in town, and because the director of that halfway house received like a stack of letters from my community that says, we are his community. We got him. Please let him come home. I got to go to church that first weekend across the street. talking about God, like watching out for us, right? Across the street, Jason Hedger was one of the leaders at the church. He lived across the street from where I was. So he would give me rides to church and it was so cool. And so that was just kind of like, you know, I mean, I mean, there's, there's so much to tell. I mean, I know we have limited time on the show, but like God's favor was just there, you know, and then I was still an immature baby. I didn't get marriage counseling when I was incarcerated. So I still had my own wounds and stuff. I wasn't willing to let go yet. So I didn't like bow to my wife and like love her like crazy when I got home. I was so grateful for her, but I was just like, I still had my stuff I, I needed to work through. Even though I now had my strong faith with God and everything, but I still had some relational stuff that I didn't know I needed to work on. Right. Still had a gambling thing. I didn't know I needed to work on, you know, and then after my, with my felonies and stuff, it was hard to get a good sales job. So I just went down the route of starting my own business and got trained to be an interventionist and a recovery coach. And I mean, I, I got to move home early on parole and it was just like all this God's favor. And it was just like, you know, this mandatory protection order we had was like just eradicated by some judge. Like it never even happened because it wasn't supposed to go away till 2026. Wow. And this crazy miracle because my wife fought for us and, and like she went to go meet with the head DA and people thought she was crazy. Like, don't go meet with the head DA. But she did because God told her to. Right. And yeah. she got to love on this lady. And it was like and then she's like, that judge will never get rid of that thing. And then we get the letter in the mail that the judge dismissed the protection order. It was like so when you look at that, I mean, you know, Romans 8, 28 says that all things work out for good. Right. For mm -hmm. those that seek him. And some days it just doesn't feel that way. He's like, seriously, this is where we are. <laughs> However many years after the incident, like we're still in some of these situations, you know, and, and I just have to believe that like there's some people in my life that say, well, God didn't want that to happen in your life. And sometimes I say, well, how do you know? Mm -hmm. How do we really know what God's plan A is? If And to tell people like, well, that shouldn't have happened because God didn't want to. Like one, newsflash, you ain't God. And two, I don't know. I mean, God uses so many things in people's lives, so many amazing ministries. I mean, your podcast, I mean, people, these podcasts come out because of people's pain. And like, I do my, it's like, there's reasons for it all, you know? And so I just go with like, God's got a bigger plan and we have no clue what it is. And so, you know, even our life today of just, we got some situational things going on in our life today. And they just seem so big, but it's like, like not, not good, big, like just kind of like how we, this makes no sense whatsoever, but I know God's got a plan behind the scenes, which is why I'm so passionate about talking about like who we are in Christ. Yeah. Like who we are. I think who we are in Christ as Christians is the most important thing we need to answer. But I don't believe, cause I see it in conversations with people, people don't think about who they really are in Christ. And what does that really mean? Hey guys, it's Hollis. Are you a busy family, a busy parent, a busy professional, or a busy student? Are you looking to meet God in a new way? Do you want to renew your relationship with God or move from religion into relationship? Are you intimidated to do a formal Bible study? Intimidated to go into a church? Or have you been hurt in the church but still long for a relationship with God? Or maybe you're simply curious about God and the Bible, but have no idea where to begin. Well, the Oh My God is Awesome membership is the weekly way to gain bite-sized biblical wisdom about the character of God, so you can grow closer in relationship. To get more information about our monthly subscription membership, go to ohmygodisawesome.com.
So Rob, it seems like, as you mentioned, that's like your big message for people and you use your speaking and your podcast and books to help people understand that. But what are some ways that people can take some steps to start understanding that? Oh, that's, that's a great point. Because we have to know from where we came, where we are now, where we're going, right? That's why I'm big on like coaching, counseling, and community. And so where can people start? with who I am in Christ. I mean, I just, I have a reference I go to all the time because I love, because this is where I started this journey was with Neil Anderson's work in a book called Victory Over the Darkness. Powerful, powerful, powerful thing. So people that I coach, we talk about, you know, I ask people like, how do you, how do you learn? You know, like, what's your learning style? And, but Victory Over the Darkness is an audible, audible in, you know, book form, but it's such a powerful thing to grab and grab onto. And when we can look at things and we can say who we are in Christ, I mean, my list here, I love reading just reading. It's like, I am God's child. I am a saint. You know, I am a member of Christ's body. I'm complete in Christ. I, I am God's temple. I'm God's workmanship. I'm free. Like all these things, I'm free from condemnation. Well, they're great. And I spent a lot of time last year doing and telling people this and creating a summit, a challenge and all these things, you know, but the thing was, I, I was, there was so much doing in my life. I kind of stopped just setting with God in those statements, you know, and I've gotten back to that now. Just like, okay, just, I'm going to sit on those and just believe those hundred percent. Uh, Cause there's things in my life that aren't the way I would like to be at 49 years old, but, but they are, you know, and, and, and just some big things in front of us. I'm just like, okay, God, you got this. Like, I know you got this. And so in the meantime, I'm going to go do advocacy work. I'm going to, share people's stories like you get to do on your podcast, share my story and testimony. And because when you look at like the word testimony, the middle letter in testimony is I. So I'm in the middle of that story, but who yeah. am I? Well, if I know who I am in Christ, you know, it's a much more powerful testimony than just like, what was me? Here's all the crap that happened in my life. You know, gosh, well, a victim mentality. And it's like, no, there's so there's growth in everything that happens to us. And for, for me, I won't say us, I won't include you all, but there's, there can be growth in anything that happens in my life. I just have to be smart enough to open my eyes and sit back instead of like, go, 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 go. I'm like, no, let's sit back for a minute. Let's pause. You know, and, and I've learned a lot about myself in the last two months in this awesome three months, this awesome men's group I'm a part of. Some false self stuff has come up and I'm like, huh? Oh, wow. Okay. So I'm not going to get mad at that false self. I'm going to embrace that part of who I am and acknowledge it and not be like, well, that's not part of me. I'm like, no, actually it is like, you still deal with suicidation. That's one of the things, but why? And so, but I'll tell you this, the why I'm so important on who I am in Christ. Cause reciting that, what I just said to you earlier about like, here's some of the things I say back to myself. I've wanted to drive my car through a guardrail still in my life today because whatever's going on in my head, a big argument, a big fight, a big low self-loathing moment or whatever. I'm like, forget this. I'm going to go, I'm, I'm doing it. And I was like, no, you're not. It's this battle, right? Of like, go kill yourself. It's like, no, you're a child of God. You're my child. I love you. You're my workmanship. No. And, and I say these things out loud because it's a spiritual battle that we're all in. And, you know, and when I'm by myself and isolated, like I, you know, my brain doesn't function as well as when I'm plugged into mentors and men, not dependent on them, but plugged into mentors and Bible studies. And so and I'm, and I'm not ashamed to say that I deal with that. You know, I mean, last year I wanted to drive myself through a guardrail because I had just had a really bad day and I was angry and pissed off. And like, I'm like, I had my dog in the car. I'm like, I'm not going to kill my dog. Oh, that's your dog twice. Yeah. Different dog, but different dog. Uh, and I was oh. like, Man, I'll just write a note on it and put my address and say, please take him home. I'm like, no, like you, you are my child. Like I will really say these things out loud and battle it sometimes. And I'm like, that's why I think if I didn't believe that stuff, I mean, I don't know what would happen in my life, but I, but I do. And I say it out loud and I'm committed to that. Rob, are you actively being treated for mental illness, depression, anxiety? Are you actively like in therapy for that or anything right no, now? No, I'm not. I mean, it's, okay. it's just something that, you know, I've come to grips with, with God and just other mentors in my life too. And okay. so I'm more, I'm more, more readily talking about it with friends of mine. Like, Hey, I'm really struggling. Here's what was going on last week. Okay. So I'm not, not doing it, but no, I haven't sought deep therapy and counseling for that. I did a lot back when the fire happened and stuff, just mm -hmm. kind of like understanding that. I'm like, I, 
I mean, I have other friends that deal with suicide ideation. And so we talk about it and it's just like, I don't need a, you know, like a therapist twice a week to battle. I, I believe in that. Right. Yeah. I don't feel like I need that right now because I know, I know what triggers it. I'm like, okay, you, dude, you just got like in a fight with Jen over something really stupid. Quit being so immature, you know, like those kind of things. But if I don't process that with people, I can let it fester sometimes. And, and, you know, some of my friends are like, dude, why do you talk about that? I'm like, cause this is one of my thorns, man. It's just like, sure. Yeah. And, and one day God, hopefully he'll take it away or maybe he won't. I don't know, but I don't ignore it anymore and I don't entertain it. I just can tell when it's there and um, it doesn't happen a lot. You know, it comes in, you know, like maybe once or twice a year, but it sure used to come a lot more than that. I just didn't know what to call it. Right. Yeah. I didn't understand like, what does that mean? It was just like, but it's, uh, it's not just self-loathing and stuff. I mean, it's, it's something, but it's, uh, the good thing is it doesn't stick around. I, I were studying my scriptures and I call it out and, 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 and that's just one of those things. I'm like, I'm battling for this thing for my life and, and everything too. And, you know, I got a lot to live for and a lot to do and God's in control and all those things. And, but I think for a little while, I just, it kind of stopped like one eighth of an inch from my heart. It was almost there. And it was just like, just stopped. And it was like, okay, dude, just get whatever's blocking that. Just get rid of it and just feel it. So now when I say these things, I feel them and I believe them and I love them. And, you know, I, I love what, Oh, the other thing I use the other tool, Hollis, you asked me something was the book is one thing, but I tell people to go watch the chosen. Yes. The movie on YouTube. I'm telling you right now. Yeah. Like it. Bring, oh, you love that too. <laughs> oh my God. I have been like promoting that like yeah. second after my own podcast. I'm oh. telling you that is going to change the world. Like you can see like a personality of Jesus. Yeah. You can, I mean, I've wept every single episode that you can see the personalities of like the disciples. I'm like, oh yeah, I could totally see Peter doing that. Yeah. You know? And it's like, oh, Matthew, you are so weird. You are yes. the quirkiest person I know, but, <laughs> but that's the way God wired you. But, mm -hmm. but I see that and I'm like, man, that's just, that's just a bunch of goofs that's like did their life. And God said, Hey, like, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to hang out with you. Cause like, you know, everything, but Hey, you like, you know, my, my loved, my beloved saint who sins, come hang out with me and follow me. And like, yeah, okay, cool. And, uh, and there's such a beautiful depiction of the Bible. It is, you know, yes, absolutely. And we're all, we're all goofs. Like we're yeah. all we're, like, it's really funny. And Jesus yeah. is hilarious actually. Yeah. And I think he's really like that too. <laughs> I funny. do too. Question for you in your speaking and your engagements where you're kind of sharing your testimony with people and in the conversations where I would imagine, you know, you're providing encouragement for people. Would you say, so for the ones that maybe are not believers now, do you, do you ever like go over that bridge with them or do you just kind of meet people where they're at? Because I guess I, I'm always of the belief that whatever trauma or drama or anything that happens in your life, you know, you can go through all kinds of recoveries and read tons of books and people can do well with that. But if you, if that person does not introduce God or find them or include them in their healing, it is not going to be long lasting. What is your opinion on that? Yeah, totally agree. That's one of my sadnesses about the addiction field that I work in as an interventionist and a coach and stuff is that there's just, there's a lot of just don't do that. Don't drink anymore. Don't do that. Do this. Don't, don't do that. Pee in a cup. I mean, I mean, it's like their life is just kind of like these don't do's and more of a shaming life, but there's so much freedom in Christ that people can receive. So whenever I get invited, like last, last December, like, you know, it's all these online summits, you know, it's like, yeah. hey, hey, hey. So, so I, you know, I got to speak on 10 summits, you know, between last November, December and January, which was awesome. And just various topics too, just because I can cover a lot of different things of just being a professional and dealing with self-loathing and, you know, not getting into the whole prison story and all the other Christian stuff. Right. It's just like, just compartmentalize. Like if, if people need me to talk about suicide ideation or addiction, or how do you help the family or parenting from prison? Like, that's one I like to talk about. How do you parent from prison? I did a lot of cool stuff that God kind of showed me through that to state to let my kids know, like my kids school sent me their homework so I could do their homework before. And then we would do it on the phone. And my son's like, wait a minute, how, how do you know what I'm? And I said, because I had your school send me your homework Aww. so I could be their dad from afar, you know? And, 
yeah. I got to do an article with prison fellowship about that, but, but it is that just, you know, sharing and yeah, I'll go speak at, you know, like a, a treatment center or that's not a Christian treatment center, but I always share my faith no matter what. Okay. Yeah. yeah and, and people that are inviting me will know that part about me. And if someone says that we don't you say anything about Jesus stuff, I'm like, well, <laughs> you got the wrong guy. Cause I'm, you know what I mean? If it's cause I've had someone specifically say, can you please not talk about God or Jesus when you share your story? I'm like, well, then I'll be sharing somebody else's story. So Rob, it still sounds like you're in the middle of your story in the middle. You, I, in the middle of your testimony, as you said. Yeah. You, God um, continues to do stuff. So, and I love, you know, you mentioned a word that was brought up in a prayer session that I had this week condemnation. There's no condemnation. There's only conviction and the Holy spirit will convict us and reveal us of things, but it will never condemn us. Mm. So I think that's a really important distinction. So do you feel like, what do you feel God is convicting in you kind of at this moment as we find you? You know, it's interesting. So about a year and a half ago, I kind of stepped out and said, you know, I'm a Christian interventionist. I was going through this journey of God. You want me to be an interventionist? That's a Christian or coach that's a Christian, or you want me to be a Christian interventionist. You know what I mean? And there's a big difference in how people receive that, right? It's, and so I went out and said, hey, yeah. So like if, if you were to, say if you were to go to my website and you were like, oh, well, here's this guy and, and you know, he does interventions with a little bit of my faith story. But when it, so he's an interventionist that looks like he's a Christian. But okay. I started presenting myself more because I feel like God was saying, I want you to be a, a Christian interventionist that helps families, individuals find freedom in their addiction with Christ. Mm -hmm. big difference in how you present yourself and how it comes across that way. Now, people know that in my actions and stuff, but a lot of people are seeking a Christian interventionist to help their family, not just an interventionist. Does that make sense? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So it was something God just put on my heart. So I started really stepping into that. And, and here's the sad thing about that is the sad thing, a good thing, you know, it's, I was never fearful that people wouldn't come hire me. It was just, I knew a lot of people wouldn't, and there was going to be this transition period, right? Of, oh, well, you only work with Christians. I have a lot of people in my field say, well, you only work with Christians, so we're not going to refer to you. And I've never said that, but it's because yeah. I'm a Christian in a lot of ways. It has caused people to go the other way to not send people my direction because they're like, well, we don't want the Christian stuff on them. And so that really did some weird things to, to my business model last year. And so you ask where I am now, Hollis? The thing is like, I'm really good at what I do. Like God's like really put me in this field to help people in this way. And I love it when families call and say, Hey, you know, we're believers and you can pick up on that. And we get to pray and we, I, I get to text them worship songs and like really bring Jesus into the healing process instead of be aloof kind of like, well, yeah, you know, it's kind of him and hawing. So I love it when a family calls me and they know that's what I do. But the, the thing that stinks about it is my phone. I'll just say this. My phone does not ring as much as I hope it would. You know, and, and I, and I, and I haven't figured that thing out right now, you know? So, so you ask like where I am now and my journey is that, you know, if my phone are ringing more, I would just, this is all I'd be doing is, is interventions and coaching and podcasting. And, and I would love that. I feel like that's a place God's called me, but the sad thing is it's not, you know, and podcasting isn't a place you make, you know, tens, 20, $30,000 a month, right? It's more of a passion project with some supporters along the way. Yeah. It could be. So I'm in this space right now, like, God, what are you doing in our life? Is it, is it to go work somewhere and, and be an employee somewhere for a while and just do this on the side? You know, I, I, it, it's this weird space right now, just kind of like, I don't know where to go. So I'm in this thing of like interviewing for some great ministry jobs and we're talking to some treatment centers about doing outreach for them. And, and in the flip side, I just hoping my phone just starts ringing like crazy. And I, and I'm able to just start helping people and be able to do all the advocacy work that I've been doing. And so I don't know where it's all going right now. I'm open to whatever I've, I've taken some of the blinders off and been more open to not just the addiction field, but I've been in it for five years. Right. So it's God saying, take a break. I don't know. So I'm just seeking and journaling and just kind of in this, okay, like, you know, guy, wherever you want me to go, I'm going to work my tail off for you in any industry it is or whatever. So so yeah, so I mean, even in the Addiction Freedom and Faith podcast and the other, my Beyond the Bars one, it's like, I'm not doing a lot of that right now because I just don't know what the next chapter is going to look like. So there's well, grieving had I've had to do along the way too, just kind of like not being mad at God. But I mean, I did go through about a three week depression and beginning of the year, just kind of, I just was sad. And like, I've, worked, I've done so many things last year, like the Denny and Christ Summit and this challenge. I'm just like, 
and it just didn't bear the fruit I thought it would. So it was God just like, I just want to see if you would listen to me and go down this path, not with a financial reward. You know, it's, it's, it's just a very weird season, but I have a lot of peace with it and just kind of okay to see where it goes. I completely understand exactly where you're at. I feel very similar in my journey. And it's interesting because Lori, we're talking about like, we have a podcast that shares stories, but we're a Christian podcasters, I guess, is how we can yeah. kind of frame that as well. And yeah, you mentioned Rob earlier about just resting and not do, do, doing. And for people like you and me, I think we're very similar in that regard. It's like, we want to do all these big things and we're wanting to be obedient and it's interesting when you're in that place where the outcome that you predicted or wanted isn't exactly where God has you right now, but we're still in the middle of it. So mm -hmm. I completely resonate with uh, <laughs> where you're at. I have a question that I want to kind of use to bookend our conversation. So thinking back to where you were as a kid or, you know, a preteen in your relationship with Christ and where you are now, how would you say, where, where, where are you in relationship with God right now? Well, I can tell you, this, I'm, I'm getting back to more of that childlike behavior in faith, you know, cause it's, I, mean, I got, I got 11, 13 year old and I can be stressed around the house sometimes and just kind of like kind of poo poo dad sometimes. And I don't like that guy. <laughs> so just really getting back to the innocence and beauty of like being a kid and just enjoying life is where I'm getting more back into now, especially with my faith is just really just because I mean, for people that have been through like crazy hard seasons in their life, right. And they were in tune with God. Like I was in prison and stuff and I can read through those journals. I'm like, man, I, that's cool. That's so awesome. Like, I don't even remember writing this stuff. So being real intentional with my relationship with Christ right now is kind of really where I am and really trusting him. Cause as a kid, you're just kind of like, woo, woo, like, you know, these things are just happening just because, and it's all fun and dandy and great. We don't have a care in the world. Well, why can't I be like that at 49? Yeah. Be responsible, but just be like carefree and just, so yeah. So, I mean, it's just really, I think just sitting with God a lot more. I was sharing a, we went through this exercise in this men's group I was a part of, but this might be a cool visual of just, I don't know, maybe a, seal it, putting the, putting the bookend on, I guess, if you will. But so I remember sitting after the fire and all this stuff and, and I was sitting in prison and I, and I just was just praying to God, like, you know, what, what is all this? You know, we lost almost everything and I was sitting there and had my eyes shut and it was just this, you know, grassy field, like beautiful field, you know, like, you know, and, and I probably was probably reading Matthew at the time, talking about, you know, how he clothes the flowers and feeds the birds, like just takes care of everything. Right. Why can't he take care of me? And then I remembered the whole thing just got just black and charred, just like a fire, right? And just eradicated. I'm just like, wow. And But in the far distance, I literally see this just white blob. And I'm like, what? And you're kind of like in your dream, like you're like leaning in, right? In this, this moment. And it was Jesus on the other end of this charred field. And I went to him and he opened his arms and he took me to the edge of the of like this rock looking over the field and he's like that does not define you and gave me a big hug and i like put my head on his chest and just like burrowed into jesus and just held me there and i was like wow that's pretty cool and then the field got really beautiful again and it was just kind of like you know the and it was the message that our past does not define us it only shapes us who and we're becoming but what defines us is who christ says we are and I'll never forget that vision. I haven't shared that story. I shared a couple of days ago. I'm like, man, I just totally forgot about that. And so no matter what's happened, it's like we're on this journey and God cares about the small details of our life. And, and he just loves me and loves you. And, and he's watching and listening. And I just got to be smart enough to pay attention. Mm. And you have a tangible reminder of how God takes care of the small details and cares for the small details. Can you share that with us? <laughs> oh yeah. Way to, way to go. Love it. You're so observant. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> that's really funny. You're awesome. So, okay. So behind me, I always have my little black bear in the background. So if people ever ask me about the black bear, I get to tell this story. So this is the black bear story. So my wife and I were coming back from Steamboat Springs, which is in the beautiful mountains of Colorado. It's about two and a half hours from our house. And we went to go run a marathon with a friend of mine that had leukemia, right? And it was a great weekend. 
and we're coming back. And as we leave Steamboat, I said to my wife, as we're going up Rabbit Ears Pass, I said, hey, honey, would you please pray that I see a black bear today? And she's like, okay, God, let my husband see a black bear. She's lived here her whole life, and she's never just seen a black bear, like, walk right in front of her, right? And so she goes to sleep. My kids go to sleep, and I'm driving. And we come in, we're coming into Silverthorne, right on the other side of Eisenhower Tunnel, into Silverthorne. And there's these two Ford F-350s that are just looking into a field. And it, I caught my eye because I'm like, they're just, like, staring at this empty field. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, no way. And I literally slam my brakes on at, like, 45, 50 miles an hour, whip a U-turn. And guess what was crossing – the two lane highway, a, a big bear. black bear. And we got to see his butt just disappear into the brush. And, and I was just cracking up. My wife's laughing and my kids are like, what the heck just happened? And about a couple months later, my wife bought me this black bear and she gave it to me with the scripture on it. It says, delight thyself in the Lord and he give, he, he and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Psalm 37, four. And to me, that's just a reminder that God truly does care about the small details of my life and the life of his children. And he likes to show off sometimes and say, I heard you and I'm going to deliver this thing. Your wife thought was totally ridiculous. And here it is. And yeah, so I, I, I love my little black bear. Oh, that's awesome. What a great story to end on. Thank so Rob, us. as we like to do with all of our guests, we would like to pray for you today just to demonstrate that. Anyone can pray anytime, anywhere, any words, and that God is listening to us, even those minute details like asking to see a bear on a road trip. Hmm. So what can we be praying for you today? Well, a big thing going on in our life right now, which we would love prayer around, so this is pretty cool, is you know, after the fire, we moved into this person's house, and we've been here for eight years. We had a, a five-year lease to own on the house that we're living in. And this was something that this woman came and said, God told her to give us this option to buy this house. So five years later, the Denver, Colorado market is crazy. And the house has skyrocketed in value. And this individual is not willing to sell us the agreed upon documented notarized price for this house right now. So we're in this really unfortunate lawsuit <laughs> in this situation that could have been an amazing part of our story and just really trusting God to show up in this. And so my prayer is that God would open her heart to go back to the five year, five and a half years ago where he told her, this is what I want you to do for them. And it has now changed because the market has greatly increased here. So it's sad and it's just causing a lot of disturbance in our life. And we're just really trusting God. But my, I'm not angry at her. I've got, I've worked through that, but I'm more hoping that God will open her heart to get back to what he told her to do five years ago and bless her, bless her life tremendously, mm -hmm. not at the expense of our checkbook. Absolutely. So that's a big deal in our life right now. That probably the biggest nuisance, I guess, or hiccup or bump or obstacle or opportunity for growth, whatever you want to call it going on right now. Awesome. Well, as we enter into prayer together, Lord, um, we thank you so much for Rob and his journey and his story. Lord, we are thankful that you have been with him every step of the way, through every experience, through every encounter that only has equipped him to serve and love on others and to help other people understand that their identity is not in their works. Their identity is not in their past. It's not even in their choices, Lord, other than just to choose to follow you oh. and that you create their identity. Help people to um, move that from their heads to their hearts, Lord, as they draw closer to you. And Lord, specifically, we pray for Rob and his family with the situation with the home that they're in. We ask that um, you open the heart of the homeowner and remind this person of their willingness and obedience um, in your calling upon their life to bless Rob and his family, and that um, they would honor the agreement that they made here on earth, but more so that they would honor the agreement that they made with you, Lord. And just that through this process of softening her heart, 
that she would be blessed in giving to someone who has literally using their life experience and your life within him to serve and love others. So Lord, we just um, thank you again for Rob and his family, ask you to bless their circumstances. And it's in Jesus name that we pray all of this today. Amen. 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 Well, Rob, I want to personally thank you so much for taking the time to share your incredible journey. And I have a feeling that we'll be asking you to come back on the podcast and update us as you move into a new decade here pretty soon and all the amazing things that God is going to do in you and through you. So thank you so much for today. Yeah, thank you. I feel uh, blessed just to hang out with you all for the, for the last hour. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was so nice to meet you. And and for those that cannot see him either, he has this really, again, you win for the shirt too. He has like this ACDC, the ACDC lightning bolt, but it says Jesus on it, but the S is the lightning bolt. So that's really awesome too. <laughs> and so, yes, thank you so much for sharing your story. Before we close out the show, will you just tell us what are the names of your podcasts? Yes. Uh, so, Beyond the Bars Radio is one that started three years ago and Addiction, Freedom, and Faith began last year. Okay. And for everyone, we'll have links to these in the show notes of both the YouTube episode and the audio episodes. And then Rob, also, what is your Christian intervention business? How can people find you? How can people reach you? liftedfromtherut.com is okay. the website. And I always just say, man, the quickest, fastest, easiest way, because what I deal with is a lot of crisis is just call me at 970-331-4469. And I definitely mean that call or text. I will help you in crisis. That's what I do. Oh, that's awesome. Again, listeners, watchers, we'll have this in our show notes. So Guys, everyone, as we close out the show, as always, thank you if you watched us. Thank you if you listened. If you're on YouTube right now, literally, there's a there's a, a red rectangle box. It says subscribe. Just click on it for us, please. And then that will also allow you to be notified when we put out new episodes. And then if you are a listener, if you would also please subscribe to um, the podcast. And if you love it, you guys, if you love the stories that we're putting out, of course, we always want honest feedback. Um, would you also just give us a review and a rating? That also really helps us just get our word out there, get our name out there, which just allows us to expand our reach. So thank you, everyone, again. Hollis, great to see you. Thanks. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Oh My God Pod with Hollis Moore and Lori Spiker. We want you to know that God desires a relationship with you, just like a trusted friend. Our desire for you is to find hope, inspiration, and connection through today's story. And we hope that you will experience God in your own unique way too. Stay connected and share your stories by joining our Facebook group, visiting our website, ohmygodpod.com, and of course, subscribing to the podcast. And remember, Oh my God is awesome.